for uh, this meeting. Let us pray. Father, thank you for everyone that is here today and joining us online. Give those in authority, our Prime Minister, Minister of Education and officials of the Ministry of Education, other ministers and members of parliament, leaders of organizations and their representatives, wisdom in every decision and help them to think clearly. Grant them discernment and common sense so they'll be strong and effective leaders for their decisions have a great impact on our lives. Help them to lead and govern with integrity and may their integrity guide them and keep them on track. Father, only you truly know what we are setting out to accomplish today. We have an idea, a vision, and some guidelines. We have talents, abilities, and time to work. However, only you can see in perfect detail the end of every beginning. And nothing is ever in vain if guided by you. For even mistakes and missteps are used for good. For your righteousness transcends all our efforts and understanding. Our prayer today is that you, your will be done through this meeting. So set us free from selfish wills that we may work together efficiently. Take what we have prepared and multiply our efforts as only you can. In a world where it seems as if the odds are stacked against us, give us renewed strength and courage to face the task that lies ahead. And Lord, grant us success so that we may tell of your divine providence and sustenance. And others will come to know that though our circumstances will be difficult from time to time in this life, you are always our unwavering protector and shield. As we deliberate, may we be mindful that we asked you in prayer at the beginning of this meeting to be present with us so that you are at the center of our consultation and not simply an afterthought or a ritual to be done at the beginning of a meeting so that in every way, truth, sincerity, and love be demonstrated in speech, action, and demeanor. We recognize that the impact of a pandemic has caused us to meet at this time. And so we ask that you, the great physician, continue to care for and comfort all those affected and infected by COVID-19. Be with all those on the front line. Bless this meeting today. Ready us to make every moment count. Keep love at the forefront of our minds today and the guiding light for all we set out to accomplish and celebrate on behalf of those in our care. Grant us success, Lord, so that at the end we not only accomplish our goals, but we go away saying, "'Tis good, Lord, that we were here." And now a prayer for our children and our young people. God our Father, we pray for our young people growing up in an unstable and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more meaning to life than the ways of the world, and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them to take failure not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and to keep alive their joy in your creation. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving, believing that you can do more than we can ever ask or imagine. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Ellis. 
and I hope everybody in here feels blessed. Uh, Dr. Greenwich and members of the head table, Prime Minister is in, in her absence. Uh, members all, the, because my co-chair is not sitting next to me, I almost forgot, Senator Tony Moore. Um, this meeting, or these series of meetings, have been arranged for the purpose of discussing the BOSS program. It has been arranged by C2SAB in association, C2SAB and its constituent members in association with the Barbados Workers' Union. The two main reasons for this meeting is one, to allow the originators of the program an opportunity to sell, put forward, discuss this program with you. Secondly, it affords you the opportunity to come face to face with them, to raise your questions, to voice your concerns, or to make the comments that you may want to make. I say that because we in the leadership of the labor movement are aware that there is a lot of misinformation out there. And the only way to empower people is to share information so that by the time you leave here, you will be much more empowered than when you came. By so doing, we expect and hope that you, the membership of the respective unions, will be able to communicate very clearly and in an unambiguous way what you would want for vis-a-vis -vis the BOSS program. This morning has been scheduled as the one for the workers in the educational sector. Those of you who are not in the education, but you are here, this is not intended to exclude you. So you are here, you have every right to be here. So you don't need to feel intimidated or slighted in any way. So feel free to fully participate at the appropriate time. I would now invite the president of the BUT, Mr. Sean Spencer, to join the head table. The, um, he's being invited in his capacity as the, the leader of the largest um, union in the education sector. I, but I also recognize the, presi the presence of the secretary of the BAPS, um, the, the, the BAPS Association, the, Associ the Association of School, of Secondary School Principals. And I am also advised that my man, will you keep standing so don't come up? The, he is somewhat disabled, so he's taking longer than normal. And along with him is the General Secretary, Herbert Gittins. So uh, I just have one other piece of housekeeping to do. Um, the 
use of this gymnasium requires that member that users are made aware of some emergency procedures in the unlikely event that we have to resort to them. So pay attention while the promo is played. Thank you. Just before I introduce senior advisor in the Ministry of, uh, of Finance, Dr. Kevin Greenwich, to do his presentation, I should let you know that we are going to be joined by persons in the electronic sphere, the Zoom and other platforms. At uh, the appropriate time, you will be advised of just how many there are. I can tell you that I have already been advised that the president of the BSTU, Mary Redmond, is uh, with us on Zoom. Thank you. Dr. Greenwich. Thank you. And Good morning to everyone. Once again, I apologize for the absence of Prime Minister. She'll be here shortly, but um, she's been up all morning taking part in the organization of the African Caribbean State Pacific Summit. Uh, so that's not too long concluded, so she'll be here shortly. In the meanwhile, you need to bear with me <laughs> while I do the presentation. So allow me to. Uh, Share my screen. Uh, here we are. Okay, once again, good morning to everyone. Um, the BOSS program, Barbados Optional um, excuse me, Savings Scheme. And what I want to do this morning 
is basically to take you through the details of the program, the scheme, explain to you how it is a benefit for all workers and how it can achieve the objective for government in terms of creating fiscal space. I know many of you have heard the program in different forms, so hopefully I can answer most of your questions this morning. So let me begin by asking the question, why now? Why do we embark on such a program at this time? Why the need for it? And to answer that, in fact, I can just say one word, two words, and that be the answer, COVID pandemic. Well, let me explain what I actually mean. Prior to the onset of COVID, Barbados, as you know, would have um, had in its birth program, been on its birth program for two years, and will have achieved a number of milestones and have the economy on its path to, to growth. And so in March, end of March, at the end of our fiscal year, our projection for the next fiscal year, we expect revenues to behave a certain way as it did before, continue to improve and, and grow as the economy improves. So we're looking at 3.1 billion in revenues. But along came COVID, the pandemic, and our best estimate at that time, and still remains, is that government will lose about 450 to $500 million in revenues. Revenues because they are related to tourism. Those as the tourism collapse, and by the way, tourism, this is still a tourism, much so um, dependent economy, as most in the Caribbean are. It comes about 45% of our economic activity through hotels and restaurants and taxis and everything related to these services, and still account to between 50 and 60% of our foreign reserves. So it has, when tourism is, has been decimated, destroyed as it is at the moment because of COVID, we get a large impact. So on the revenue side, we're losing between 450 to $500 million. At the same time, in response to COVID, the government would have stepped up its um, expenditure and in a response, direct response to COVID, from as early as um, mid-March, you have noticed about the quarantine facilities being outfitted, particularly the new one that was built at Harrison's Point. Um, the upgrades to, to, to the different polyclinics, including the, um, to, to also house and contain, identify the virus and, and try to deal with the issue. The increased expansion as it relates to medical supplies and as it relates to equipment, medical equipment. And that response directly to tackle the COVID issue. At the same time, as it became apparent that this was with us for at least most of this year, it will be, and we country went on lockdown, again, there was an effort to step up to mediate the impact, the impact of that on the rest of the economy and to help persons survive and, and, and come out of this in one piece. And so our government would have been implementing over two budget speeches, we heard a household survival program to the tune of what, 45 million, which saw increases 40% in the contribution, the, sorry, the assistance to the welfare clientele, which saw $600 being paid monthly to the most 2,000 vulnerable families, and was told that that's been, that was expanded. The demand was high there. It was seen the Adopt the Family program. It was seen providing assistance and still doing it. And that we talk about later to NAS to, to deal with the issues. At the same time, not only household and families and individuals, but businesses and trying to keep businesses not close out, not shut down, because the hardest thing to do is start a business that I've got that day. But if a business come down, pause, and try to use this period to improve and to be ready to take off, then that's easier when the economy opens up. So we've seen the $200 million um, tourism fund that allowed the hotel sector, hotels to use this period to refurbish, to improve their stock and be ready to take off. The 40, 000, 40 million loan VAT fund that allow for cash flow to borrow against past VAT filings. Um, self employment persons benefit 1,500 a month. Um, business cessation benefit for, for those persons. And other um, measures including trying to fast track projects to, to get private sector employment and employment general, generally going. But still amidst all of that, given the follow has been tremendous, we've seen as of two days ago, well, that's the last number I know. And NES claims was about 42,000. 
Now that's not necessarily bodies, but it's still a large proportion of our labor force, roughly a third. I was talking about some employment numbers that were previously 9.5%. We're talking about almost 30%. So though there's an urgent um, a need and indeed a responsibility for government to now see what it can do to ex again assist in that direction. And in terms of the best way of true economics and true government step up is to really expand the Capitals Works program in areas that will mop up some of that employment. In areas where you can now do some work on schools and painting and refurbishing, fixing up things that you plan to do but you've got to bring forward or accelerate. Um, other builds, government buildings, doing some work on those areas. Work in areas that not necessarily depend on tourism, but can still get some economic activity going. So when tourism comes back, you're ready and help you spur growth and accelerate faster. Um, you're talking about growth program. We're talking about beautification and environmental cleanup, debushing and things like that. We're talking about sanitation program. And those things will help soak up some of this employment in order to reduce any social uh, adverse uh, fallout. So that now will cost, uh, cost the government, we're looking at about 100 million to 110 so million dollars in additional fiscal space to do that. Now, I stress the word fiscal space by recognizing that not everyone in the room is economists. I, let me spend a moment to explain what I really mean. What I do not mean is financing. There's a difference between fiscal space and financing. I'm not going to take you to the university or anywhere to explain it. I'm use a simple analogy to explain what it means to you. What do I mean by fiscal space? Now imagine that you have a 40-foot container, and this is perhaps the best analogy you could come up with. You own a 40-foot container. That's government fiscal space. That's your fiscal space. That's where everything you spend must fit in this container. Now imagine that you are the Bill Gates of Barbados. You got all the money in the world. All the finance outside that container. The rest of the, you got bills of money. So do you have a finance problem? No. But you've got a space issue because everything you can spend must fit into that container. You understand me? So you got your mortgage in there for your household. You got your mortgage in there. You got your food bill in there. You got um, your utilities bills in there. You got your inside, outside. <laughs> You know what I mean. You got all your bills in there. Everything got fit in that co container, right? Good. And if you want to spend more <laughs> on one area, you got to reduce something on the other area. For government, your fiscal space is like that. Government will got its wages in there. It got a good expansion on goods and services, the equipment for the ministries and, and different things and supplies in there. It got an interest bill in there from past debt. It has transfers in there that money will go to UE, QE, QEH, UWI, Transport Board, and other institutions to help them in their normal operations. And it got its capital expansion in there, that container full. Now, before I tell you, so in order to spend more in capital, you got to do other things in the other areas to save, right? Not a, not a money, it's a space issue. And government would have looked through its different expenditures, particularly in the ministries and budget, and try to repurpose and refocus them. Now we also, you've got to look at everything. So now we look at wages, and the idea if you could save a hundred million dollars on wages, then you could put that to capital. But you just don't want to save a hundred million on wages, because there are many ways to do that. You can cut employment. But that is not what government wants to do. They want to maintain employment. So you've got to set some objective. I want to maintain employment, but I still want to trim the wage bill. Wage bill. But I don't want to cut wages neither. You see the dilemma? Don't want to cut wages, I want to maintain wage bill, but I want to maintain the person's salary. I don't want to cut employment, but I want to save on wages. What do I do? So we come up, so here's the idea. You are where everything in this space container is registered and measured in cash basis. Cash. Cash is king in this container. So if I can replace party wage bill with something that is not cash, voila. I save some space. So if I can pay the worker a large proportion of his salary as cash and a small proportion as a bond, the bond don't go in the container, the bond go in another container. That's the debt container, not the bond con not this container. Then I have that space to put in capital. So you understand the idea of space? I can tell how the container happened to be 40 foot and not 50 or 60 or 20 in the moment, but I want you to understand the concept. So last year, government wage bill 
in cash, what we recorded was $806 million in central government. About another three to 400 in the uh, SOEs. Let me focus on 806. If, I, if we could save 10% of that by paying 10% of that, for example, as a bond, the workers still get their money, employment is, is maintained, but I record how much? Not 806, 706, right? In this example, you know I mean? I record 706. That extra 100 million now, that's a bond in my debt container, but I have space that I can now put 